Report. Tonight, on this anniversary today of Kevin Rudd's Sorry to the Stolen Generations, embarrassment for the Albanese government and evidence that makes me say the whole thing is a myth. You have not been told the truth. Plus, Lisa Wilkinson attacks Channel 10 for sacking her from the project and throwing her under the bus in the Brittany Higgins rape case. Also tonight, pressure grows on the ABC and on Victoria's Liberal leader to apologise for defaming a campaigner for women's rights that they linked to neo-Nazis. But first, you know, it is disgraceful. It is an, an insult to our democracy when politicians refuse in Parliament to tell voters the plain truth when asked. Like the truth about things that affect your safety. Yet today, again, the Albanese government's immigration minister refused repeatedly to tell you what it actually done or not to keep you safe from the 149 foreign criminals he'd released into the community. Now, I'm going to show you just how Andrew Giles would simply not give a straight answer about those seven murderers or those... 37 sex offenders or those 72 violent criminals and armed robbers and the rest that is let out without proper monitoring at first after the High Court ruled he couldn't keep foreign criminals in detention indefinitely. And I'm going to show you the questions he was asked today and the way he dodged every one and ask you, is this acceptable behaviour? How dare this minister keep from you the facts? You are being treated with contempt like mushrooms. Can the Minister confirm the hardcore criminals he's released, including rapists and murderers, have now received over $3 million in free accommodation and welfare payments? I remind him and all members that it was a decision of the High Court that required yeah. this government, yeah. and indeed any government, and indeed any government, Order. Order. to to Order. release the detainees in question. And I remind him as well that the arrangements in place for the support for people who are released from immigration detention are the same as they were when he was the minister responsible. Paid you a lot of it because there was no answer you needed to see it, nor was there an answer to this question. In Senate estimates last night, it was confirmed that the minister, not the Community Protection Board, is the final decision maker in relation to the conditions placed on the 149 former detainees. Given this, can the minister now tell the Australian people how many of the seven murderers and 37 sex offenders released into the community by the Albanese government are not wearing ankle bracelets? I've acted in accordance with their advice in every decision that I have made. Again, no direct answer. It <laughs> made it got worse. So Giles was asked an even more direct question. Does he know whether these foreign murderers and rapists are... Does he know where they are? Can the Minister inform the House if the whereabouts of any of the 149 criminals is unknown. Each one of them is being continuously monitored. Order. And of course, as I said just earlier, we've criminalised our strict visa conditions. So if anyone who thinks they can get away with those, we will find you. So they're being monitored, but there was not a yes or no whether they actually got away. But that thing, or if they think they can get away with it, or uh oh Ooh, does that mean some have taken off? Whereabouts unknown? That's alarming. But yet again, he wouldn't answer a direct question on this. And this is now a pattern with the government. You remember how the Prime Minister, of course, wouldn't answer questions about how the voice would actually work? Minister, does the government know the whereabouts of the seven murderers and 37 sex offenders? All individuals in the cohort, all of those who are required to be released by reason of the court's decision, are being continuously monitored. Being monitored, yes, got that. But does the government know where they all are, these murderers and rapists, yes or no? It wouldn't, give, it wouldn't say. I mean, this is ridiculous. It's because 
Giles is simply unable to give a yes or no answer. Is this some sort of switch in his brain? I don't know. Or is he just too scared to tell you the plain truth? That No, well, actually, I don't quite know where they all are. I mean, has he lost track of the murderers and rapists and pedophiles and thieves he's let out or not? I mean, how hard is it? And there were other things, too, that this immigration minister refused today to tell Parliament, like, uh, I mean, simple questions. Um, why didn't he go to any of the three meetings in his own office between August and October last year to discuss the policy options before the High Court said, you've got to release all these criminals? Didn't go to any. Why not? Wouldn't say. Nor would this immigration minister say why he has not yet used the new laws that were rushed through Parliament just before Christmas to give him the power to ask courts to put even one of these, this, these criminals back in detention. Why didn't he do that? He didn't ask for even one of them, including the 18 who have since been charged by police for breaking the law again. We are taking it seriously to ensure that applications are made properly. I mean, I don't think he gave one straight answer in the entire question time, and so many questions. He wouldn't even explain why a guarantee that he gave last year that every person that he released would have an ankle bracelet on to monitor their, their whereabouts. And yet now more than 30 don't. How did that work? Wouldn't say. Now, Minister is there to serve you, to serve his community. You pay his salary. But what we saw today was a man trying to save his own hide by telling you nothing. Out, Mr Giles. Out, out and out you go. Meanwhile, to another scandal, the legal pressure now is mounting on Victorian Liberal leader John Pesuto to say sorry for his role in the shameful bullying of three women a year ago. Three women who were just arguing that women-born women should have safe spaces and not have to share them with women-born men. And now the ABC is threatened by legal action as well. Now, these three women, there's British women's rights activist Kelly Jane Keane, expelled Victorian Liberal MP Maura Deeming, and gender-critical feminist Angie Jones have all issued concerns notices against Pesuto, accusing him of defaming them for linking them to neo-Nazis, with Deeming's case already set for a trial in September. And Kelly Jane Keane has now issued a concerns notice against the ABC as well. And I would love to see justice finally done after the sick bullying those women endured, and especially Keane. I mean, she came out to Australia last year to campaign for safe spaces, like toilets, for instance, for women, born women. But the transgender lobby monstered her in Tasmania, stole her microphone at a Melbourne rally, and had Australian Senator Lydia Thorpe try to physically stop Keane speaking in Canberra. But the Liberals in Victoria were so weak that they couldn't even defend this woman's free speech. Just the day after the Melbourne rally, uh, leader John Pesuto, Liberal leader, is, well, seems clear to me, he suggests that Kelly Jane Keane was linked to neo-Nazis, was even a sympathiser, uh, relying on inaccurate information he'd got from Wikipedia. We don't stand with neo-Nazis. We don't stand with white supremacists. And Keane now says the ABC's Sarah Ferguson also defamed her when she completely missed the point of what Keane had posted before her Melbourne rally the organiser of the rally, and this is someone with very clear, for our audience, very clear um, far-right associations. I, I just want to be clear for the audience what we're talking about here, for anyone who hasn't followed this closely. You produced, as I mentioned earlier, a dossier of the organiser of the rally that details her associations, and they include a particular image that she posted, and we're going to run that now, so we're very clear what we're talking about. It is the pride flag overlaid with a swastika and includes the words Pride Starpo. And it went on. Now, as I said the next day, Sarah Ferguson, how blind do you have to be? What Keane obviously meant by that graphic was not that she was a Nazi, but that the transgender activists attacking her, they were acting like Nazis themselves, OK? Joining me is Federal Liberal MP Claire Chandler, who was due to speak at Keane's Canberra rally last year, but didn't when it was hijacked by activists. Uh, look, great to see you, uh, Claire, but how do you explain the madness and the hysteria and the violence, particularly in New Zealand, that broke out last March with uh, Kelly Jane Keane's visit? 
Well, frankly, Andrew, I think it is inexplicable that we're living in a country, or indeed New Zealanders are living in a country, where women who are speaking out and defending their rights to single-sex spaces and services are being treated in this abhorrent way. But sadly, it has become more and more common in recent years, um, whether it's threats of violence, whether it's threats of um, losing employment, whether it's cancelling on social media, some of the stuff that women have to put up with for speaking out about these issues is absolutely disgusting. Now, I genuinely do think that the tide has started to turn and, and I think that the Let Women Speak rallies were a, a bit of a turning point for that because Australians were finally um, able to see just how much women have to put up with when they're speaking out in defence of their own spaces and thought, this isn't right. Um, there's nothing wrong with women having access to single-sex sport and single-sex services and single-sex spaces, and they shouldn't be threatened with violence yeah. for doing so. But Claire Chandler, look, you are so right. I mean, I see that. I don't care almost what the women are trying to argue, but th that bullying is just unacceptable. But what really frightened me was while I had the reaction, here were the Victorian Liberals, the party supposedly of free speech and all that kind of thing, um, selling the women. I mean, it, it, it was... How did that happen? And what should John Pesuto, the Liberal leader, do now? Look, how that happened is a very um, interesting question, Andrew, and it's one that um, John Pesuto uh, has to answer fundamentally at some point in time through whatever process um, he's currently going through. But I'm a Liberal woman. I've been speaking out um, very publicly and passionately about these issues for some time, defending women's spaces and women's services and women's sport. And there are plenty of other Liberal women who I know do exactly the same thing and likewise feel very passionately about these issues. So um, there's no place for this sort of cancellation in the Liberal Party. On the other hand, um, certainly we know within the Labor Party and within the Greens, uh, w women are absolutely trampled on for speaking out about these issues. And, and the reason I know that is because the overwhelming majority of the time when I'm contacted by women who are concerned about the erosion of their sex-based rights, they're not women traditionally of the right of politics. They're women traditionally of the left who feel abandoned by the left on these issues. Senator Chandler, you're absolutely correct on that because there have been, uh, I think, uh, one Green office holder that lost their job because of uh, questioning this. Um, but let's not let the ABC off the hook either. I mean, ha the ABC's role in, in, in the hounding of Keane and others and, and smearing, uh, I think, even of people like you, uh, was, was appalling. I mean, how, how, do, how is it that the ABC should be so close to debate? Oh, look, it's completely unacceptable from our national broadcaster, but um, more broadly than that, the ABC needs to do what many of the media outlets in this country, particularly the left-wing media outlets in this country, have to do, which is start accurately reporting on these issues when women are fighting, um, fighting for their sex-based rights and trying to defend their sex-based rights. Um, like I've said many times um, on, on your show and, and on others, that the media has not helped this situation the institutional capture of the media has indeed, I think, um, deplatformed and, and censored much of the debate around this issue. So there's a long way that the, the mainstream media in this country has to go um, to uh, allow women to be able to, to freely uh, talk about these issues. Uh, no reflection on the, the good folk at Sky News. They've been very good in, <laughs> in providing myself and others the, the, the space and time to talk about these issues, but some of the other outlets leave a bit to be desired. Yeah, well, the ABC, don't forget, is funded by all taxpayers to give all sides of a debate, and clearly it is not doing that. It is a special responsibility, and it's shirking it. Uh, Senator Claire Chandler, always great to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. Now, honestly, the, the, the bullying of a woman on national TV, and there you see... The ABC and all that being part of it, it just infuriates me. I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, talking about the ABC, the boss, David Anderson, he claims the national broadcaster is not biased. I mean, we'll just give you another example of the nonsense there. Well, today he had to front a Senate committee to defend this ludicrous position. Like this example of bias from an ABC reporter identifying as Aboriginal.
For First Nations people, for my people, this is a very important day to remember our ancestors and those who fought for many decades to improve the living standards for our people and remember that it always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Joining me on Newswatch is Sophie Ellsworth, media writer of The Australian. Uh, Sophie, you were covering uh, these, uh, this inquisition today. How did the ABC boss deal with that example of ABC bias? Well, Andrew, great to be here. Look, David Anderson basically said when Bridget Brennan, the Indigenous Affairs editor at the ABC, a very senior position, was saying always was, always will be Aboriginal land, she was just reflecting a perspective. Uh, he dismissed any claims of bias. And, Andrew, this is what we see time and time again. It was also noticed, uh, noted that in her coverage on Australia Day, she said in one interview uh, with an Indigenous man, she said it's been a tough year for our mob, hasn't it? Now, I contacted Bridget Brennan this afternoon to see what she had to say about the fact now the ABC Ombudsman is investigating her comments in what is expected to be straight news reporting on the ABC. But on Australia Day, I would argue we saw some pretty partisan and divisive comments from a reporter who is supposed to be neutral, Andrew. Yes, here is uh, David Anderson talking about her. And always was, always will be is a common term that's been used by companies, it's been used by many people to reflect the fact that we have the oldest living continuous culture in this country. It is, it is not uh, a statement of uh, intent rather than it is a statement that is commonly used. And I think that when that cross happened to Bridget, that Bridget was reflecting the perspective that, that she was encountering when she was there. We have somebody who is a First Nations person who will identify as a First Nations person uh, openly in these crosses, as well as reflecting uh, the perspectives of others, but quite clearly doing that. Uh, we want to satisfy ourselves that you know that it is calling out a personal perspective as opposed to um, a broader one. So you need the qualification for it. I mean, the dripping of politics there. First Nations, for instance, is a loaded political term for Aborigines borrowed from Canada. And another common phrase that you don't hear on the ABC is that we're one country and forget race. No race division in this country, right? Uh, you don't hear a commentator say, oh, look, uh, by the way, Bridget, I don't believe in this racial division, uh, you know. You don't hear that. Only one view. I mean, seriously, how does he expect us to take this thing seriously? Well, Andrew, we've got quite a few reporters in the ABC. Bridget Brennan is one who have very senior roles in editorial. And it appears ABC management just go always on the defence. Now, why in an Australia Day report are you splitting the room and saying it always was, always will be Aboriginal lands? Correct. And it was only that I did a report on this, it resulted in numerous complaints following to the Ombudsman that they are now investigating it. So let's see what the Ombudsman comes back with. Let's have an open mind, Andrew. But we know how often these things fall. Oh, yeah, look, I'm not going to hold my breath about the Ombudsman finding bias at the ABC. Sorry, sorry. I think the Ombudsman usually forgets their glasses. Um, how did the, uh, uh, David Anderson, the ABC boss, deal with the uh, Antoinette Latouf controversy? Now, she's the uh, Lebanese-Australian. That's how she identifies. Lebanese-Australian anti-Israel activist who, for some bizarre reason, got a job as casual presenter on the holidays on ABC Radio, ignored orders not to post controversial stuff on social media and got sacked. How did that go? Well, not well, really, Andrew. Look, many of the senators tried to question David Anderson about what unfolded with the Antelou Antoinette Latouf sacking, uh, but he said he had legal advice. He cited that he'd be making a public immunity claim and he would not be commenting because this is now before the fair work. So that <laughs> saga just mm -hmm. rolls on. What a lot of a mess for someone who was only doing five shifts was sacked after three. How odd, uh, though, isn't it, that uh, they find to their horror that they have someone, that they've hired someone who's a vehemently anti-Israel activist. I don't hear them hiring someone by accident who's a vehemently anti 
Palestinian activist or, uh, you know, pro-Israel activist. How about that? I don't hear that. Somehow these mistakes always go the other way. Now, I have to admit, I'm feeling a little bit less damning uh, of Channel 10 presenter Lisa Wilkinson. Um, she was in court today in a fight against Channel 10, which she says threw her under a bus after she was sued by former Liberal staffer Bruce Lehrman for allegedly helping him, uh, helping to identify him publicly as the alleged rapist of Brittany Higgins, which he, of course, strongly denies. What is she alleging in court? What was she saying in court today? So I'm paraphrasing here, Andrew, and I have to be careful, but basically she was saying she got legal advice uh, by Channel 10 lawyers uh, and management. She was also given advice that she could give this speech at the Logies that we know later resulted in the derailing of the Brittany Higgins, Bruce Lerman uh, criminal trial. So she basically said she got the advice, she took it, and she gave the speech. Uh, the head of... Uh, Channel 10, Beverly McGarvey, was praising her after the speech, she said. And then later down the track, <laughs> they've pulled Lisa Wilkinson off the project. They've effectively sacked her. Um, now, we'll make this point, Andrew. Lisa Wilkinson has been around for a very, very long time. Yes, she got this legal advice, but I always say as a journalist, it's up to us too to make sure that we are comfortable with saying whatever words are Correct. coming out of our mouth. And for someone as experienced as her, I agree with you, she was given advice, it appears, but there's got to be a bit of onus on her too. But let's see how this unfolds. You are spot on, and I think Channel 10 was weak in not releasing that advice to uh, at least say, uh, give her that cover. Look, uh, the fault was always uh, also with Channel 10. I thought that was pretty weak. Sophie Ellsworth, thanks for your time. After the break, the stolen generation's deceit on this very day that the Albanese government says, remember our sorry to the stolen generations, Kevin Rudd, 16 years ago, let's remember that. It's hard to admit it's uh, removed even more Aboriginal children this past year than the past one. So, if it's saving Aboriginal children today, removing them, why was it genocidal before? I'll show you the facts that they never teach at school. Every year on this date, it's the same useless, dishonest theatre. Today is the anniversary of Kevin Rudd's apology to the so-called stolen generations 16 years ago. We apologise, especially for the removal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families. But to underline what a sham it all is, this year, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese admitted today that on this very anniversary of saying sorry for stealing Aboriginal children, we in fact have taken even more of them into out-of-home care last year than we did the year before. Outcomes have worsened for four critical targets. Children's early development, rates of children in out-of-home care, rates of adult imprisonment, and tragically suicide. Now, this doesn't make sense. We're supposed to believe the removing some children 30, 40, 50 years ago, many with one white parent, that was shameful and racist and even genocidal. But removing children today, even more of them, that's of course to protect those children from harm. Does that switch make any sense to you? And I say it again, it is important that we do face this truth about the stolen generations. It is wildly exaggerated to say the least. Here's my evidence again. In the first big stolen generations test case for compensation, it was lodged nearly a quarter of a century ago in the Northern Territory by Peter Gunner and Lorna Kabilo. The federal court then ruled against them. The court said the evidence does not support a finding that there was any policy of removal of part Aboriginal children, such as that alleged by the applicants. He was talking about the Northern Territory then. Gunnar and Kabilo seem to have been removed, in fact, not because they were just Aboriginal children and not for racist reasons, but for their welfare. Lorna Kabilo, for instance, was taken to the Retta Dixon home in Darwin where she was, when she was eight years old because she'd been found in a bush ration camp with her mother and grandmother dead, her white father long gone, and the only person who could be said to be minding her was actually working for long periods at a station 60 kilometres away. And I ask you, who leaves an eight-year-old 
out the bush like that back then with no school or proper care. Or you take Peter Gunner, the other one. His mother out at Utopia Station was persuaded by a patrol officer to send her boy to Alice Springs to get him some schooling. Not stolen at all. And it's the same story in dozens and dozens of cases I've checked. And that's why, of course, our courts have still not found one case of a child stolen by racist officials just for being Aboriginal. Not one. You go through some of the cases. It's not just the Gunner and Kabila one I've just discussed. In New South Wales, the Supreme Court there ruled that an Aboriginal woman suing for compensation had been stolen but given away by her mother. West Australian Supreme Court ruled that seven children wanting compensation for being stolen from their parents had actually been removed for the safety. In Victoria, Stolen Generations Task Force could not find one truly stolen child and even admitted Victoria never even had a policy to remove children just because they were Aboriginal. Yet the Stolen Generations myth lives on, fed by reckless politicians, and the film Rabbit Proof Fence, shown in so many schools, a film that claimed to be a true story but wasn't, instead invented many incidents like this of, suppose, child stealing. Now, this Stolen Generation story has caused huge harm, most of all by leaving social workers too scared to save some black children from real danger today. I'll tell you just one of the horrible stories like that, which I've covered in the past two decades, some have involved children even dying. The Kevin Rudd speech I showed you, you know, I'm sorry, big hero. But about two hours after he gave it, a court in Queensland, same day, heard an appeal in a case that shocked the country. The seven-year-old Aboriginal girl had been raped in Arakan in the Cape York Peninsula. She had syphilis and fetal alcohol syndrome. Eventually, she was handed to white foster parents in Cairns. One of the parents even quit work to give her the care that she needed. All was going as well as could be expected. But then two fashionable social workers took over that case when this girl was 10. And they told the white foster carers, look, taking the girl away from her culture like this, can't have that. It's repeating the stolen generations, right? So she was sent back to Arakan for a while. And there was pack raped again. Six times, in fact, by nine boys and men. Now, the court was told that the rapists thought this was normal in their community. In fact, many of the boys themselves seemed damaged. Most lived with grandparents because their parents couldn't care for them. Now, this is an extreme case, maybe. But it's not quite unique. I once asked an academic, Robert Mann, to name even 10 children stolen just for being Aboriginal. And when I checked his second attempt, the first was hopeless, I found it named Topsy, for instance, a girl who'd been rescued from a station when she was 12, fatherless, what we called then half-caste in a black tribe, and with syphilis. And it was Dolly, who was found working for nothing on a station when she was 13, seven months pregnant and penniless. These are stolen children? Now, I know many people now do say they're stolen. And maybe that's in part because governments now hand out up to $100,000 for people who say they're stolen with few questions really asked. But the truth does come out now and then, like it did with Faith Thomas, who was raised by missionaries in South Australia's Colbrook home after being taken there when she was sick. Had I not been in Colebrook, I would never have got the opportunities that I did have. So I I consider myself not stolen, but chosen. Joining me is my Tuesday panel, Will Kingston, host of Australiana, a weekly podcast from The Spectator, Australia on politics and culture. And Danika DiGiorgio, host of the new chat show called The Jury, every Sunday here at Sky at 8pm. Will, the other thing today that got me was the Prime Minister announcing he's going to spend more money on housing in the Aboriginal outstations and on creating 3,000 supposedly real jobs for Aborigines in remote areas. Here he is. Today I announced the creation of our Remote Jobs and Economic Development Program. This is a better approach. It will fund community organisations to create 3,000 jobs in remote areas real jobs with proper wages and decent conditions. Honestly, Will, isn't that a dead end, using public money to create so-called real jobs out in remote settlements and towns out bush? 
This happens again and again in the Indigenous Affairs conversation, Andrew. We are so desperate to find solutions to what are admittedly dire problems that we forget about the basic laws of economics and we forget about how markets work. Fact is, the government doesn't have a good track record at artificially creating markets because it shows that if the government has to do it, there wasn't the will on the part of individuals to take advantage of a particular opportunity or there just isn't a market need there in the first place. Now, the sad reality is that not just in Indigenous communities, but across Australia in small towns, there hasn't been great opportunities and there hasn't been for 50 years. And so you've seen people, whether they've been white or Indigenous, have had to move to bigger regional centres or to the cities. This comes back to the fundamental truth in this conversation, Andrew, and that is if you want to improve your lot in life, sadly, it's on largely your own head to do that. Uh, and it means that you probably will need to move out of a small rural community to a place where there are further opportunities. Now, is that fair? Is that is that nice? Is that good? You know, maybe, maybe not. But the fact of the matter is it's a reality and the government needs, we need to be able to say that this is largely on the individual. It's not on the government to be able to uh, improve these situations a lot of the time. Danika, isn't it the case that People have got to be honest. Uh, if ever, you know, if they want Aborigines, some, most are integrated and doing quite well, but out bush, if they want Aborigines to live close to the land in so-called Aboriginal ways, they cannot, their, their welfare cannot then be judged by Western standards, right? You've got to accept the lowest standard of living, I'm afraid. You can only really get Western standards of living if the children out there get Western standards of education and the chance of getting Western standard jobs and opportunities, which are mostly in the cities. And this is exactly the problem. We know that billions of dollars, Andrew, has been spent to try and close the gap over, uh, over several years and nothing has worked. The government's come out today and said we're going to spend $700 million to create this 3,000 new job program in remote areas. Well, the question is, are there even... Is there even a demand for this level of jobs? Is the infrastructure available in remote areas to cater for this number of jobs? Where have they got that 3,000 figure from? There are so many unanswered questions. And this is a lot of money. We're talking $700 million. This cannot just be a pipe dream figure of 3,000. There needs to actually be a reason why 3,000 is the number that they've chosen. Is it going to create tangible outcomes? I disagree in a way with what Will said. I, I do believe you need to move the city probably to, to be able to uh, get the, the opportunities. But a lot of people out in remote areas, they don't have the means to be able to move to the cities. So it's about putting together a program to decide where the money needs to go. And I'm just not 100% sure that throwing up a 3,000 figure is the answer to this. No, and I don't think maintaining welfare ghettos out in the uh, remote parts of Australia, where there's nothing but welfare basically keeping a lot, a lot of those communities or some of those communities alive, is going to lead to anything good in any generation at all, no matter what race or whatever it is you are. It just does not work. Um, Will, the Albanese government uh, is looking at new laws against what's called doxing, in this case against things like we've been seeing uh, recently, anti-Israel activists leaking names and even some personal details, uh, in some cases, of 600 Jews in a WhatsApp uh, discussion they were having, a, a group there. People, they say, these activists say, are Zionists. In, and the, the, releasing it, of course, is intimidating these people. What do you make of it? Do we need new laws for this? Yes, in a word, Andrew. Uh, I, I think, you know, I'm always uh, always delicate when it comes to matters of free speech, but we also need to recognise this is one of the situations where there is a legitimate limit on free speech, and that is where it, it does infringe on, on the privacy or the safety of, of Jewish people in what is at the moment a highly sensitive time for the Jewish community. Now, this is also unfortunately where our uh, protections on free on on privacy don't go far enough as a society. But uh, in this instance, I have no sympathy for people who are maliciously trying to spread the personal information of Jewish people with the obvious intent of, at the very least, making their lives harder, or at worst, potentially putting them in, no. in harm's way. 
and knowing uh, the hate that's out there too. I think that's the context too. Danica, what do you make of it? I completely agree. These laws are needed. We're in 2024 and this awful, awful list is being circulated by people who genuinely want to cause harm to the Jewish community. The New South Wales Board of uh, Jewish Deputies, they've already said that one family had to go into hiding because their five-year-old daughter was being threatened. And there's been multiple instances of this since that list was circulated. Imagine how violated you would feel as a family to have all of your personal details, your pictures, private sensitive information in the hands of these people. I understand we are advocates of free speech, but this just goes too far and we cannot let this happen. It's just awful and I really feel for everybody who's been violated by this. Yes, and the people who are on it that have received government arts grants and things, I think they should be struck off that little register too. Anika DiGiorgio, Will Kingston, thank you both so much for your time. After the break, America's left (laughs) is stuck on a highway to disaster. Maybe it's not that funny, though. Joe Biden has, as you know, now lost it as president, really. But the Democrats can't actually sack him ahead of the election. America faces a real crisis of leadership. There's President Joe Biden. His own appointed special counsel said last week he was too forgetful now to face even trial for illegally storing top secret documents in his garage. But then the person who's supposed to fill in for him if he's incapable is his nitwit vice president, Kamala Harris, who's just put up her hand again to say, oh, yes, I'm ready to take over from Joe Biden when everyone knows she's just a cackling lightweight. <laughs> Joining me is Sean Spicer, the first White House spokesman for then-President Donald Trump. I can imagine what can be and be unburdened by what has been, you know? What can be unburdened by what has been? What can be... Sean Spicer, thank you so much for joining me. Look, a crisis is coming for the Democrats and for the United States, isn't it? I mean... You've got a president who seems to have lost it, with all due respect, he's he's lost it, but his deputy is hopeless. The Democrats, though, urgently need to find a candidate to run against Donald Trump in the elections in just 10 months' time. What are they going to do? Well, you know, I, I will tell you, for all the criticism of Biden, Andrew, the one brilliant thing he's done was ensure that his vice president was more unpalatable than he was. So no matter how low his approval ratings go, Kamala Harris's are even lower. There's a poll that came out this weekend uh, by ABC News here in America that said that 86%, 86% of the American public doesn't think that he's fit to serve a second term. So he's created quite a conundrum. But here's the thing, Andrew, despite that, And the same thing's pretty much true on the Republican side as well, that people just, I think, sometimes don't fully appreciate, is that right now, Joe Biden is accumulating all of the delegates to become the nominee on the Democratic Party. He's literally gotten rid of the competition in any significant way. What that means is they will go into that August convention in Chicago for the Democrats, and he is their nominee. By rule, he has the requisite number of delegates to become their nominee. And unless he chooses to give them up, he is the nominee of the Democratic Party. That's the conundrum that they face. They can't do anything about it, no matter how bad the polls are. The delegates that he has accumulated between now and August will allow him, by rule, to become the nominee. And despite what everyone wants or thinks in the Democratic Party, They have no choice but to make him the nominee unless he personally chooses not to be their nominee. So there's no possibility of a palace coup, you know, the delegate delegate suddenly changing their minds? So so the way that this works is that we use a phrase called bound, meaning the delegates that you accumulate are bound to the candidate to which they are awarded to. So, and that's on the Republican side. I think that the Democrats are fairly similar so that they can't just vote for somebody else of their choosing. Now, if Joe Biden dropped out or you know, withdrew in some way that he said, I'm going to allow you to go do this, then there would be a fight on the convention floor. You mentioned that poll. 
right, uh, that said that more than 80, more than 80 percent of Americans thought that that uh, Joe Biden was too old to be president. Something like more than 60 percent also said the same with Donald Trump. I mean, obviously, uh, m many fewer, but still quite a considerable number. I don't worry about that so much, to be honest. What I worry about, Sean, and I hope you can talk me out of this, he told the rally in South Carolina how he got European members of NATO, the defence organisation that includes the US as well. It's a mutual defence force, you know, so yep. they're telling the world, you attack one of our members, you attack us all. Um, and he said this is how he got them to start paying, the European countries, start paying more towards Europe's defence instead of just expecting the US to pick up the tab. Here he is. One of the presidents of a big country stood up and said, well, sir, uh, if we don't pay and we're attacked by Russia, will you protect us? I said, you didn't pay, you're delinquent. He said, yes, let's say that happened. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. You got to pay. You got to pay your bills. Now, Sean Spicer, I think that's been overinterpreted uh, to make uh, Donald Trump look like he'd, uh, he'd never come to Europe's defence. I'm not quite sure that's what he was saying. Still, there's that isolationist argument there. Does that, should I be worried? No, and I would I would urge you to look at the four years that he was in office, Andrew. Right, he he went over. We he he professed his commitment to Article Five of NATO, which is that an attack on one is an attack on all. There at NATO headquarters, I stood by his side when he did it there. Uh, so he understands the role of NATO. But as an American, I think what he recognized was when people joined NATO, when these countries came together, there was an agreement that countries would contribute you know, what, two, three percent, I can't, I'm, I'm catching it off guard right now, to their own national defense to ensure that they were helping to contribute to the agreed upon mutual defense of any other country when it was attacked. And frankly, most countries in Europe weren't doing that. Their view was, hey, America will come save us. And Trump, as the negotiator that he is, needed to show them that, hey, you can't keep relying on us to do this. You made a commitment. We're going to hold you to that. And frankly, for too long, Andrew, U.S. presidents were allowing European countries to get off the hook from a commitment that they made not to us, but frankly, to each other. And what happened after Donald Trump said that? More of these countries started stepping up to their own national defense, their own national defense. This wasn't that they were giving us money or giving anyone else money. They were doing something that was in their own interest. But America doesn't just give money to itself to protect, to build up our own national defense. We do it to make sure that the world stays free. And too many people were getting a free ride on that. They were being able to fund roads and bridges in their own countries, while we weren't, so that we could make sure that they remain free if attacked. And I think I, for a lot of Americans, they were ready to see Donald Trump, not just in this instance, but in so many others, stand up and say, America is not paying for everybody else to get a free ride anymore. Uh, look, I think uh, too many uh, European countries are treating the American army like it was their own, that the, it's the, for them to call on the Americans, but the Americans are always to pay, and I think uh, Trump is absolutely right to call that out. Sean Spicer, thank you so much for your time. Always enjoy it, Andrew. Thank you. After the break, half a million Victorians are without electricity today, and, well, what a con, the crazy government is blaming extreme weather, global warming, you know. Well, let's talk about that after this. Well, the irony of it. Turns out I'm a victim today of global warming. Now, half a million Victorians are as well because we're without power, apart from my generator, thank God. We're without power because of extreme weather, or so claims the energy minister, who's a real global warming crusader. It's extreme weather. In fact, the temperature in Melbourne after one of the mildest summers I've ever known nearly hit 100 degrees Fahrenheit, the old century, but didn't. OK, so I've known many, many hotter days. But the winds, yes, did blow over a couple of transmission lines out past Geelong, causing shortages of the kind. Well, what a surprise. Shortages of electricity that we've been warned about for years because of global warming policies that have left us short of electricity. You're stunned, of course. Joining me, of course, 
Uh, every Tuesday is Rowan Dean, it's through The Spectator Australia, and also host of Outsiders here on Sky News every Sunday at 9am. I never miss it. Rowan, Rowan, you're laughing. I'm a victim of global warming or maybe global warming policies. Uh, more likely the latter, Andrew. Clearly, uh, Chris Bowen, unlike Anthony Albanese, didn't go to the tennis uh, in Melbourne this year. Um, Anthony Albanese got booed, perhaps for, for whatever reasons. But um, Jim Courier stood, stood there at one of the finals and said, you know what? It's always so cold here at the Australian Open these days. It used to be so much hotter. <laughs> it's been, what, the last few years it's been so cold. Now, I was an American here with no axe to grind, just telling the truth, the empirical truth of how he experienced the weather every time he comes out here. Now, I've been saying for a long time that uh, the Australia I remember in the 60s and 70s was a lot hotter than the Australia I experience now. Now, others say, oh, well, how can you prove that? Look at the stats and so on. You look back at any number of headlines from that era, frying eggs on the pavement, it all had to be over 100, which was the equivalent of 40 odd degrees. Uh, regardless, you know, you can look at the data till the cows come home, but ask yourself this, does it really feel like it's so much hotter now than it was when you were a kid? And I can promise you the older you are, the more you are inclined to say, no, it does not. I remember much hotter times in the past. Now, uh, the... Every, in Europe at the moment, Andrew, your farmers from something like 15 different nations are on strike because of global warming net zero policies. The cat is out of the bag. Uh, it is utterly irresponsible. Chris Bowen will go down as the most reckless and dangerous uh, political uh, spender in Australian history. The money we are wasting on renewables when clearly the evidence is not there to support the kind of extremism of people like Gutierrez saying it's global boiling, etc., etc. Global warming policies are destroying our ability to have reliable, affordable, uh, on tap energy. And that is we're seeing, uh, uh, you know, we're seeing steelworks closed down. We're seeing uh, blackouts. We're going to see more blackouts. We now have, I gather, the Victorian uh, government was reaching into people's air conditionings and turning it down. Just wait till they can do that to your bank account, by the way, folks. Uh, so the reality is these global warming <laughs> policies are a disaster for electricity prices. And uh, as, the sooner we get rid of this government, Andrew, I keep saying we can get back to normal common sense on this matter. Uh, well, look, there's so much in that. I mean, I noticed that Sorbent, for instance, they're, they're closing up their plant. I think it's in Victoria because of siding energy prices and uh, insecurity, energy insecurity, and going to Indonesia, which doesn't give two hoots about global warming. And uh, they can just submit to what they like. I mean, this is what we're doing to ourselves. Same thing, by the way, is happening in Germany, of course, you know, where uh, China's now eating their lunch because of the price of energy over there. And you mentioned uh, the weather. Uh, look, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I know that uh, we didn't have for a whole month a single day over 35 degrees in Melbourne, which was, I think, the first time it had happened in 40 years. So, uh, you know, I know other parts of the country, uh, honestly, Rowan, and isn't life much easier anyway? You know, where is this climate emergency? I can't see it. Well, people should rely on their own, the evidence of their own eyes because, as I forget who it was that said, you know, statistics, you can prove anything what, that you like with statistics. Um, so you'll always be able to trot out of this or that or this graph or that graph or whatever. But people have to rely on the evidence of their own eyes uh, wherever they live. And if they believe the weather is worse, hotter, drier, etc., great. But equally, we must listen to people who, who say, no, it's not, and particularly older people who have the recollections of the actual times. Now, you know, uh, temperature data changes. We know that for all sorts of reasons, measuring equipment changes. The reality is in Europe, where they have pursued for a decade net zero policies, there are now protests, riots, uh, almost revolutions happening across parts of Europe where farmers and others have said enough of this nonsense. It has to stop. It is destroying us. That has to be the, the priority, Andrew, not uh, models of what may or may happen in 20, 30, 50 years' time, 100. Yeah, but global warming is going to always be there, uh, Rome, because it's a wonderful excuse for politicians to mask their failures. You know, the energy minister, oh, extreme weather. Extreme weather, that's suddenly why the state... You know, we've been warned for, for years that the state is going to run out of electricity. Here it is. 
because and it wasn't that hard a wind, uh, I don't think, uh, it blew over some transmission lines. We should be able to cope with that. But it's a great excuse, mate. Great excuse. It's the perfect excuse because it can never be disproved. There you go. You can't disprove and, and, a negative. And not only that, that's right. And people, there are certain constituents who really, really want it to be true. So that's even better as an excuse. Rowan Dean, thank you so much for your time. Coming up next is Sherry Markson. But from me, good night.